Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Wojciech uh, and I hope you are enjoying conference so far. Uh, I would like to thank you for being here. Uh, today I would like to present you a trend that is currently surfacing, but it's a not new thing. Uh, it's very pragmatic. It's on intersection of topics, various topics, and one is really close to my heart, uh, which is serverless, and I would like to talk about it. Um, quick introduction about me. I'm working with JavaScript since 2009, uh, working with Node.js since 0 0.6. Right now I'm IT consultant oriented around cloud computing, DevOps, scaling, and so on. Um, and uh, obviously a big part of my career is focused on JavaScript, but it enabled me to do much more than just JavaScript. Uh, as Organizer said, I'm from Poland, so you might struggle and it would be interested. What, why am I here? Uh, I'm invited by Future Processing, one of the sponsors of this event. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting company. You may say and you may see that it's a software house, but not only. Uh, nowadays, they are not only focused on op outsourcing. They also build their products. They work for fintech companies. They build products on blockchain. They do space tech even. So they are sending code into space, which is really cool. Uh, they have a separate division here in Ternopil, uh, and they are hiring. Petro, can you raise your hand? That's, that's your guy if you have any questions uh, regarding hiring and recruitment. Uh, yeah, so let's start. Let's pump the jam. Uh, what, does, what does jam mean in this case? Uh, before, the st before we start and explain the jam, I, I, I need to confess something. I hate WordPress. Oh, I see, I see reac reactions here. That's good because that's, that's, that's clickbait. Uh, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that I hate PHP. It's not that thing. Uh, it also doesn't mean that I hate WordPress as a platform or particular tool. Uh, I hate when we are over-engineering. I hate when, when we are introducing accidental complexity to the projects. Yagni, that, that should be the slogan for everyone. You ain't gonna need it. Uh, how many times you have seen that your client needed a simple web page with a couple of customizations and we installed the monstrosity on production and maintained it? How many times? Let's stop the yak shaving. Uh, it's also for us an operational burden. Uh, that could be easily removed with some tools. Uh, this whole problem is not only specific to WordPress, as I said. I mean, all platforms that are claiming to be a full-blown CMS or silver bullet frameworks that will solve everything. So I would like to present you the topic in three steps. Uh, what is Jamstack? Why we should bother? And last but not least, I will present a small case study with source code. Let's start with what? What is Jamstack? Let's do a show of hands. How many of you heard this term? Raise your hand. That's great. <laughs> you are at the right <laughs> presentation then. Uh, so I will not ask the second question, who is actually using it in the production? Uh, for those of you who don't know, which is the majority, those two, three letters are actually an acronym. They are not by accident. Uh, one disclaimer, that's not a new thing, you will see. Uh, it has just new clothes. So J in this acronym stands for JavaScript, obviously. We are here because of that. Our favorite programming language, our lingua, lingua franca of the internet. Uh, it's all about client-side scripting. Uh, single page applications, back in the days it was called Ajax. It's all about request and response cycle and doing stuff on the client side. That's the first thing. Second thing stands for APIs. So A is for APIs. For us programmers, APIs are ubiquitous. That's bread and butter for us. Context here is a little bit different. So it's all about well-defined services exposed behind those APIs that we can reuse. It's about the rise of software as a service, as I said. Third component is M, so represents markup. And again, an obvious choice for client-side applications, 
living in a browser, especially in a browser. Again, bread and butter of World Wide Web. Again, context is a little bit different here and a little bit more subtle. We are leveraging here a power of client-side scripting and pre-building stuff. So we are building stuff up front and then serving the plain build stuff. So we are fetching the content, building it, and then caching somewhere in order to serve. Uh, and that's basically how web works since decades. Why not leverage that? So, okay, we explained the term, what is Jamstack, and why we should bother by it, which is more important, and why we should consider it. Because I introduced it in a, uh, a, little, bit tricky uh, to play, uh, a little bit tricky way when I started by hating WordPress. So I'd like to explain it right now. So as a guy that, has to do, that deals with the operations, I like boring technologies. And that's, an, that's my opinion. That's probably controversial. But when you are dealing with maintenance, on-call, and uh, operational stuff, you would love to have a boring technology that will, not you wake, that will not wake you up in the middle of the night when they are calling that something is broken. And I mean boring by that sense. We'd like to have simplicity, predictability, and stability. And I believe the Jamstack offers that because it's much more simpler than other alternatives that out there. It's simpler because it's smaller. It means also that smaller solution is much more secure because there's smaller surface attack. If you install WordPress for someone and they are using, for example, pages, comments, and a couple of plugins, you are installing everything else with it, which means that you are need to secure that everything else around it as well. Also, you need to maintain this thing. So you need to have the operational burden of whole solution instead of serving a couple of static websites. And that actually reflects, is reflected in the costs because it's much more expensive in the long term. And one thing that I would like to emphasize is that such pages are almost infinitely scalable. That's obviously another clickbait, but if you have static web pages and a couple of client-side scripting, what, could, what can go slow there? You are basically having a really simple solution. So I'm oriented around a thing that is called static page. And that's basically how we build web for decades. And it's based on the three main pillars of the web development. We don't need to introduce anything more, to be honest. And being oriented around such philosophical, uh, such elemental things, uh, we are starting to be predictable for browser vendors. And that's a very crucial point when it comes to speed and maintenance as well. If you don't know this pattern, it's, it was introduced by Google around a couple years ago, two years ago at most. And because we are behind the browser wars, and right now we have a plethora of browsers and other solutions, and vendors are trying to help us as developers to build better stuff, they also came up with such patterns like this. For those of you who never heard about PRPL, it stands for push, render, pre-cache, and lazy load, which means that pages are, and rendering the page in the browser is optimized for the critical path. If you will push everything with your root, and then inside your markup, you will hide another links that will point out to other sites in your web page. You will basically telling the browser how to load your page up front. And browser can leverage that. Also, another very important fact for us is that we finally have HTTP2, which also brings a lot of things to the table as well. Another thing why we should consider Jamstack is that in my opinion, it's developer friendly. And I know that it's another controversial thing, but for many developers, many points of view, there will be many points of views. For people knowing Ruby on Rails, Ruby on Rails is developer friendly. A different viewpoint here is that 
you can create and later maintain such solutions uh, in the long run. I mean, not in a half year or year time span, but more than that. If you will return to some simple web page after five years from now, you will have very little work to do in order to get up to speed. For Ruby, Ruby on Rails, that may be not the case. And that thing, in my opinion, cannot be overestimated when it comes to maintenance in the long run, especially. And last two, th two points, which are very important, are related with uh, rise of serverless and rise of software as a service solutions. And I would like to emphasize that because, in my opinion, serverless and software as a service solutions are actually showing a shift in a very important direction. And without that, five, 10 years ago, uh, such stuff like Jamstack will not be possible even. Uh, with, with leveraging such things like API first solutions, software as a service, or any serverless approach, we can create complicated and uh, customized web applications. Um, and the more you do and you don't own it, the better for you because you don't have to maintain it. I know that vendor lock-in for many of you is, uh, is a thing, but, but trust me, you can be vendor locked in into a particular platform or you can be vendor locked in into legacy software as well. It's not a vendor lock-in, but it's called legacy software, but still pretty similar. So if you are considering serverless solutions, it's even more important and more critical. And that direction and that movement is very natural consequence. Why? Because of such thing. The whole serverless approach is basically a natural evolution when it comes to IT. And it's also reflected when it comes to infrastructure and creating applications. So we are shifting from data center, which is purely owning a piece of hardware and putting it in the, that lives in the data center to consuming when we are actually using some kind of APIs and we, we are not interested who actually runs it and where it runs. So that movement from owning to consuming is very important also in this case. In the current landscape, we have two flavors of serverless and you may actually heard about it. There are backend as a service solutions and function as a service solutions. I will talk in the presentation about the first one. Second one is also pretty interesting, but for us, if you are familiar with Firebase or good old and unfortunately dead parse service, you are pretty, pretty much uh, f familiar with the serverless and backend as a service concept. Uh, for us, very important thing is that those services are actually providing those typical services hidden behind the API. So for example, Firebase provides notifications, storage, and other stuff. You can leverage that building your solution without owning a single server and maintaining that single server. You can, the, the only thing is that you are paying for it. And for us, that's even better because we are paying for, it, for what we used. If you are interested in serverless small digression, this is very important and very good research paper prepared by Goiko Ajit and Robert Chatley. I recommend to, to read it. Uh, especially the economical part is uh, impressive. And if you are not into reading papers, at the bottom there is a link to the GoToConf talk prepared by Goiko, which is really amazing. Uh, one important thing, those are not random tips from a guy from internet. Uh, whole paper and whole talk provides a context and very understandable case studies when you should apply serverless and when you, when you should consider it. I talk about what and why, so let's talk about tools finally. Uh, let's discuss how to do it. And I would like to show you a tool which is called Gatsby. And how many of you heard about Gatsby? No, oh, there are a couple of hands, that's great. Uh, for those of you who never heard about it, that tool combines three elemental things. We've got, in the middle there is React, at the left, we've got GraphQL, 
and at the right we've got Webpack. And it combines those three elements, uh, provides very extensible architecture, a plenty of community plugins, and we've got very powerful combination and tool for building static web pages and for stuff that, it's, that allows us to leverage the pre-generation and pre-building the sites. How it works? I will use the slide from the documentation. Unfortunately, it's a little bit uh, weak here, but bear with me. At the top, you've got data sources, and Gatsby actually supports many data sources. Uh, you can use plain file texts from your desk. You can use various APIs, databases. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't work. So at the top, you've got data, which, is, which can be provided as a file, files, uh, like JSON, CSV files, even databases. Uh, you've got markdown, which can be prepared by someone that is not entirely a technical person. And you've got CMSs like Drupal, WordPress, which you can query and fetch the content via API. Then you've got the build step. And this is basically the whole uh, thing that Gatsby uses to pre-generate the, the sites. Internally, it leverages GraphQL for fetching that content, which is provided by data sources. And then with use of React, HTML, CSS, whatever flavor you want, you are actually building your pages and then rendering them to the, to the plain HTML files on the disk. So this step is a compilation step, you can call it. So you are compiling your web website. And then having those static files, you can go with the third step, which is deployment. And basically you can leverage every single platform available, which is popular, like S3 websites from Amazon or Netlify or GitHub pages. It might look similar for those of you who are used Jekyll or Hugo. There are people who used Hugo or Jekyll previously for your blog or someone like this. Oh yeah, so there are people here. So it's basically the similar thing, but this tool is actually leveraging GraphQL, React.js, and also allows for many, many other things. Um, I know what you will say. My client needs a CMS. You are right, totally fine. Uh, Non-technical people like what you see is what you get, editors. And, but there are plenty of solutions for that problem too. You can leverage pre-building static websites and for example, pay for such services like Contentful or even integrate an open source tool like Netlify CMS in your page. And then combining your, that tool with your markdown files, you are able to provide a human-friendly workflow for your editors. Okay, so I got prepared the case study as well. I'm not crazy, I will do, won't do a live demo here. Uh, everything is, is um, documented in the repository which is attached to the presentation. I will show you the steps that I pr with, which, which, with which I proceeded and then um, at the end, I will show you the source code, how the actually solution looks like. Uh, so I started with an empty repository, which has just the empty package JSON file, standard settings for my tools like ESLint and so on. I just added Gatsby, and then I can serve the uh, empty website locally. It's, it doesn't look appealing because it's just the 404 empty page but still you're basically able to leverage that and build from empty directory a some kind of website. That's not impressive totally, I get it. Next step, I focused on adding layouts and typography and com components. So I used a plenty of Gatsby plugins which are listed down there. I used styled components because I like them um, and that's an opinion. I also used React, React Flexbox Grid for applying Flexbox uh, layout, helmet for managing uh, the head links and body links, and font awesome for icons. And then I basically prepared the typical front end work. I created some React components, tested them, worked with them, and so on and so on. By 
doing the step when I generated my web page, I was able to actually create a very simple web page with those stuff. And that web page is basically, uh, right now it doesn't have any content. What I filled there is basically a plain text like lorem ipsum and so on. So we are not there yet. We need to have a content which can be editable. By the way, that's the site that will be soon live for my meetup in Silesia. If you are interested in functional programming, I strongly encourage you to look. Um, so that's a second step. I created layouts, components, and some React stuff. Next step. Now we need to fetch the f markdown files and from them create the pages. And I installed following plugins. Uh, transformer remark source file system, which means that I will fetch those files from the file system and then transform them into web pages. And then I worked with the uh, with other stuff, including GraphQL for fetching content, uh, which is pretty important uh, and provides a unified way to to fetch content from everywhere else in your uh, in your place. I'm looking into my notes. Yeah, very important thing. So when you are using actually Markdown and React, you would like to have your React components available in the Markdown. Probably everyone knows that you can use HTML tags inside Markdown. We would like to have the same thing with my React components. So imagine that I created a very nice component that displays the person profile. I would like to use the same component inside my Markdown. And that's totally possible. There is React, Re, uh, Rehype React library which allows you to do that. I will show you an example later on. Another step, creating more components, more components. As that page that I showed you at the beginning is basically an event page, I need to add Google Maps with the place. I need to add the contact, contact form for potential speakers. I would like to have reCAPTCHA in order to uh, disallow spam. And I need to integrate Facebook comments and share buttons in order to have very good experience. All that stuff can be done with the standard React components available in the internet. So you are able to leverage almost any React component created by someone else. Especially interesting is this uh, React Google Maps library, which has a very interesting concept which is called higher order components. I strongly encourage you to look at it. And then you can use also stuff like Zapier or any other software as a service solution for automating your backend. So I used Zapier in order to expose a webhook which will post a comment form and content of the, of the comment form into my Google spreadsheet. And basically, that will be a new entry in my spreadsheet each time that will someone actually answer the, the contact form. I'm not having a backend here. That's basically a service which is free and available for you as well. Another step. I would like to attach a Netlify CMS, the CMS that I mentioned, in order to have a human-friendly edit, editing work, uh, workflow. And you can associate those markdown files that I created, and that will allow you to um, edit them in a human-friendly way with what you see is what you get, editor. If someone is wondering, because we are exposing here an admin page, right, and we don't have backend, how we aut authenticate our users to ensure that someone who wants to edit this should have permission for, for it? And we have two options here. Uh, so Netlify CMS exposes two ways of authentication. One is the, at the top, which basically means that every single editor needs to have a GitHub account, which is not always the case, I know. For me, it's enough, and because the, the people that will edit the page will always have a GitHub account, but for you, it, it's not the same thing. This option does not require any intermediate components, any paid service, and so on. All you think, uh, all you need is basically a Netlify CMS integrated in your static website, and people that are that want to edit this repository 
they need to have uh, right access to your repository, and that's it. Uh, but that's not the common scenario when you have non-technical users. Alternative path is to use something called Git Gateway and actually Netlify, don't confuse it with Netlify CMS, which is this editor. Netlify is a service that allows you to do that. And they are actually have free and paid accounts for managing the CMS workflows uh, on the Git repositories. So you can actually hide all your editors behind a single GitHub account via this Git gateway, which is pretty interesting because you still have the history on your Git, and then those people are actually using Git, uh, and they are not aware of it at all, which is pretty, pretty interesting and pretty cool because you have still have history. Uh, but this solution actually requires a paid service, something that you need to pay for, uh, or create a free account and live with the limitations. Okay, so I talked a lot about how it looks like and so on. I will show you a source code from the GitHub. Uh, if someone is interested, I can show you later demo on my laptop. That, will be, uh, that won't be any problem. So let me switch for the, for the GitHub. So uh, this repository, it's called Gatsby Event Page Starter, and it's available publicly on GitHub. Uh, it's a typical Node.js front-end project. Uh, the most important stuff is basically hidden in package.json and Gatsby config and Gatsby node. Uh, let's look at the beginning with package.json, what we have there. So let me increase the font. Is it legible back there? Okay, so at first we've got pretty standard package JSON structure, and then we've got a lot of dependencies. That's typical for React projects because you need to attach almost everything here. The most important for me is that look how many plugins is available out of the box for Gatsby. So for example, you've got plugins for Google Analytics, for generating fav icons, which is pain in the ass, to be honest, in order to generate all possible fav icons for Apple, Android, everything single else. That plugin help, handles everything. Uh, there is plugin for sitemap, there are plugins for RSS feeds. Uh, then we've got plugin for typography and for processing markdown. So all those plugins, Gatsby Remark, are actually for processing markdown. One important thing here is the um, Gatsby Remark Autolink headers. Uh, if you remember, I told you a, a lot about PRPL pattern when we are actually optimizing for the critical path. If you, want, if you don't include the Autolink headers, you are basically, uh, you, your markdown pages will not be pushed to the server in a critical path. So browser will, won't know that there are other pages that need to be pre rendered and fetched lazily. So that's a very important thing if you like to load lazily your pages. And then we've got pretty typical Node and React stuff, uh, which is Lodash, moment for handling dates, React stuff for Facebook, uh, DOM management, reCAPTCHA, and share battles. At the end, we've got styled components, and yeah, that's, you are not forced to use actually styled components. If someone doesn't like CSS in JS, Feel free to use SAS, for example, or other, th other stuff. So that's the first step when looking at the project. Then I would like to show you two entry points to that repository, which are required by Gatsby. So first one is called Gatsby config. From that place, Gatsby knows which plugins it needs to load. So it's a typical Node.js configuration um, module. You've got a list of plugins and options for them. So for example, here we are configuring plugins for favicon, from where we will fetch the markdown files, and how to behave when we are transferring markdown, and so on and so on. Pretty self-explanatory. 
One thing that I should mention also is that every single plugin has really good documentation. And I would love to see such documentation in other open source projects. So Gatsby and the plugins are actually having very good documentation. You can be actually guided by the documentation. There is a tutorial that allows you to build uh, a very simple blog uh, in the four steps. And everything works because I did that three weeks ago or something like that. Everything worked out of the box. Um, yeah, and configuration for Google Analytics, Facebook Analytics, and so on. At the end, Netlify CMS. That's pretty boring stuff because that's configuration. Let's look at the actual code. So there are two places when we are look for code here. One is front end and our front end components, lay layouts and so on, and Node.js stuff that is actually used for generating pages. So let's look at the Node.js stuff. That's hidden in the Gatsby Node.js file. If you look there, that's basically a, a simple loop with promises that will iterate over your fetched content. And how you are fetching your content with use of GraphQL, as I said. So you are creating a GraphQL query that asks for all edges of your graph generated from files from disk, and you are able to fetch only necessary fields in order to generate those pages. So for example, you can get a file name, a slug, a type. And then based on that, you are creating pages on your disk. You can also redirect the flow to use different templates and so on and so on. So that's the Node.js part. Uh, one thing that I should also mention here is that uh, not here, in the next module. So let me return to the root and show you how the front end looks like. Inside our source directory, we've got a couple of interesting places. I will start with main layout created for that web page. It's hidden inside layout index.js. Basically, in that file, we've got pretty standard uh, React body that overrides everything which we have on our website, including head tags like meta, car set, descriptions, open graph. And then we've got the main layout style, which is hidden inside headers, footers, and we are rendering the children. Again, for rendering that index page, we are actually querying our data with use of GraphQL again. And that's the common theme for, for Gatsby. So first you are writing a GraphQL query that will fetch everything you need to render that page. And then you are actually using your component page to render it and fill it with fetched data. Another thing that I would like to show you are components. And that's pretty much the element that is very important to, to manage your site. I would like to focus on social media because that's, the, uh, that's very easy to, to grasp and very easy to, to follow. So I created the component for social buttons and rendering those social buttons under my event page in order to, to uh, visitors to share them on Twitter or LinkedIn and so, and so on. Everything that I do here is basically I create a React component that will be used somewhere else. That's pretty typical stuff if you are dealing with React. Uh, here we've got the styled component for container. Uh, and then you've got pretty much filling uh, up, you are filling up the, the React components from React share library. Uh, and you are passing down with props everything you need to render that component, which, which are here. We are actually requiring two props for that component, event and the URL. And we've got plenty of such components as you saw. So in the components, directory, we've got cookie bar, we've got details for each event, uh, we've got navigation, images, icons, forms, and so on and so on. One thing that I would like to show you is how the actual content look like. 
So those are components, but they are need to be filled with something, with data. And my content is hidden inside source events directory. And inside that directory, I've got plain markdown file. So inside that, you can see that we've, we have basically a markdown, which should be much more readable here. Um, based on that markdown, you are actually rendering the page. Uh, here you've got the, the typical um, parameters for your page. I put there the title, date, tags, location, a uh, couple of links. And then I've got actually React components rendered on my page. That's one thing to handle content. You can also do it with plain markdown files, which are hidden inside pages. Uh, sorry, not pages, but content. Yeah, here. So for example, we've got the sub page, which is dedicated to our book club. We've got reading club and we would like to explain the rules. Inside that, you are basically having a simple markdown page which can be read and write from GitHub. And that will be translated into static website automatically without any hassle. Uh, one trick that I shown you previously is that I used markdown, inside markdown I used React components. And that's not exactly uh, how it works out of the box. So you need to use this rehype React library, uh, which is explained here. So first I need to register all my components that I would like to use in the uh, markdown. And then at the bottom you can see that I, I'm instantiating the rehype React library that will actually shown uh, that, that, will, uh, that will actually show uh, and render those components inside uh, my static page properly and then I can refer, and previously I can refer them in the markdown. So that's an that's a obligatory step if you'd like to use React components inside the markdown and that could be actually an additional talk about this concept because this library is very very uh, nice but also are a little bit complicated because it leverages server-side rendering, rehydration, and so on and so on, which is pretty interesting concept from the React. So that's all from regarding the source code. Uh, I would like to show you the, the last step. So back to the presentation. Uh, obviously, such created page is nothing without deploying it. So you need to pre-generate your, uh, your static web pages and then deploy it somewhere. And you can use almost any tool and any cloud provider or any other provider you, you are currently using. My platform of choice is basically AWS because I know it the best. And I, I, I am able to actually leverage the S3 websites CloudFront and Lambda on Edge to do some fancy stuff, including A-B testing. That's often uh, an example and uh, often a very popular question that clients is asking, I, I, am I able to actually do A-B testing if you will deploy it statically? Yes, we can do it. There's no problem with it. I use that uh, for deploying uh, in AWS. I use a tool which is called Scotty.js, which has a pretty cool name and, uh, and logo. Uh, but it's working flawlessly uh, and that's why I'm using it. If you are like, if you, you would like to use something different, you can use GitHub Pages, Surge, any other cloud provider like Azure or something else. Uh, Gatsby is basically generating static web pages in a pretty standard directory form and it doesn't, it doesn't use anything fancier than JavaScript, CSS and HTML, so you are actually leverage everything to host your content. And last but not least, when we created such page, we should have profit, right? So I know that that's a lot of information to process. 
let me do a recap for you what I, what I would like to present you and uh, some key, key takeaways. So Jamstack is an alternative for traditional solutions. And what I, what I mean by that is that actually a valuable alternative for any CMS platforms or bloated frameworks that you are available down there. If your client is asking underneath the, uh, underneath the requirement, I need a CMS, if you will ask more questions and more, you are basically able to uh, distill it to something that is a static web page with a customization, have a look on Jamstack and how, how, what cool alternatives are people using there. Second step, uh, you cannot stop the serverless or software as a service evolution. Uh, we should embrace it, we should be prepared for that. And I showed you that uh, uh, with a little bit of coding, you are actually able to leverage Gatsby and uh, Netlify CMS to build a straightforward, smaller and more maintainable solution for any CMS platform. Um, and that's it for, for, that's all what I have. Thank you very much for your patience and I will answer any questions that you will have. Uh, here are the references that I used to create this presentation. So uh, a last point, the 12th one, is repository with case study. That's what I show you. It's publicly available. Feel free to, to dive into and uh, prepare a pull request or an issue. Thank you very much.